Okay, so I think that's it's about time just to begin with this first plenary session uh, of the conference. It's, uh, great to see so many people here today, really. Um, this first session is um, about a key a key concept in Tolkien's Tolkien's literature and also in Lewis, as we will see uh, in a different shape, perhaps. Um, a catastrophe, which was a, a term coined by Tolkien to describe. Well, I will leave that. To, to Guillermo to talk about. Um, Guillermo um, is a man that I met 10 years ago in Germany, and the first, the first time I saw him, I thought it was Sean Connery walking across the courtyard of the university, <laughs> straight out of the name in, of the rose. Um, but then I realized when I met him and talked to him that it was actually Gandalf, <laughs> with a bit shorter beard. No, but um, um, what can I say about Guillermo Spirito? Many things. He has, he has, um, he's been active in many different fields. And, um, well, formally, he's a conventional Franciscan, as you can see. Um, he lives and works in, in Assisi in Italy, um, which was the place where St. Francis um, lived and did his own work in the Middle Ages. Guillermo was born in Buenos Aires in 1958, and he got his doctorate in Rome in theology, with a specialization in spirituality. And um, since 1994, he works in Assis, at the Theological Institute of Assisi, and at, also at the Pontifical Faculty of Saint Bonaventure in, in Rome. Um, Guillermo has taught university courses in many different countries, um, all over the world, actually, Croatia, Romania, Russia, Canada, and he goes to different um, um, retreats with the Franciscans also, as African countries, Zambia, Kenya, Ghana, also in Egypt, Turkey, Lebanon, all over the world. He has, he has given lectures on Tolkien, which is probably his, his main um, literary uh, academic pursuit, together with Dostoevsky and, and other Russian writers, um, but many different things. He has published extensively on Tolkien's works, in both articles, essays, and books, several books in Italian, um, but many publications in English, which is what I've read by Guillermo mainly, his, his English publications, and on very different topics. Speaking with animals is one of them, a desire that lies near the heart of fairy, or articles about wolves, which is another special interest of Guillermo, wolves. Ravens and eagles, a mythic presence in The Hobbit. He's written about tales from the Silmarillion, Beleg and Turin in the light of the medieval tradition of friendship, um, he's he's um, given lectures also on Gandalf, the wise through the wisdom of the desert fathers, outer and inner landscapes in Tolkien. He has been touching upon many different aspects of Tolkien's work, as you can see. So uh, I'm delighted to have him here today with us and, and to have him give this talk about a catastrophe in, in C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis and, and Tolkien. So um, let us welcome him with an applause. It's very nice to have you here. And I'll give the word to Guillermo. Thank you, Martin. So the, <clears throat> the, the title that we have chosen is Tolkien's Eucatastrophe in C.S. Lewis as a question. Life and death between surprised by joy till we have faces, a grief observed and beyond. The three major works on, by C.S. Lewis. I should say that I'm greatly helped in my presentation thanks to the work done by Eduardo Segura, uh, C.S. Lewis y el sentido del dolor, reflexiones en torno a the problem of pain y a grief observed. So if I by chance succeed in looking a little beyond him, my vision will be like that of Pippin on the shoulders of Tribute. Most of what he sees, he sees thanks to the good old end who carries him. So although we should like, we would like to speak more about C.S. Lewis, we need to start with what is eucatastrophe. So as is a neologism created by Tolkien, we start with a quote from on fairy stories. 
where he wrote, there is the oldest and deepest desire, the great escape, the escape from death. And fairy stories provide many examples and modes of this. But the consolation of fairy tales has another aspect than the imaginative satisfaction of ancient desires. Far more important is the consolation of the happy ending. Almost, I would venture to assert that all complete fairy stories must have it. At least, I would say that tragedy is the true form of drama, its highest function, but the opposite is true of fairy story, since we do not appear to possess a word that express this opposite, I will call it eucatastrophe. The eucatastrophic tale is the true form of fairy tale and its highest function. The consolation of fairy stories, the joy of the happy ending, or more correctly, of the good catastrophe, the sudden joyous joyous turn, for there is no true end to any fairy tale. This joy, which is one of the things which fairy stories can produce supremely well, is not essentially escapist nor fugitive. In its fairy tale setting, it is a sudden and miraculous grace. It does not deny the existence of this catastrophe or sorrow and failure. The possibility of this is necessary to the joy of deliverance. It denies, in the face of much evidence, if you will, universal final defeat. And in so far is Evangelium, giving a fleeting glimpse of joy, joy beyond the walls of the world, poignant as grief. But the eucatastrophe we see in a brief vision that the answer may be greater, it may be a far-off gleam or echo of evangelium in the real world. The use of this word gives a hint of my epilogue. It is a serious and dangerous matter. And Tolkien continues saying that he wants to, to show that all fairy stories can become true. And he puts a uh, final st statement with great courage, saying, the birth of Christ is the eucatastrophe of, ma of man's history, and the resurrection is the eucatastrophe of the story of the incarnation. This story begins and ends in joy. It has preeminently the inner consistency of reality. There is no tale ever told that men would rather find was true, and none so many skeptical men have accepted as true on its own merits. For the art of it has the supremely convincing tone of primary art, that is, of creation. To reject it leads either to sadness or to wrath. So this is the main way in which Tolkien will say what eucatastrophe is. The fulfillment of all the desires hidden in fairy stories. The happy ending. But it's not the, an imaginative happy ending, but a historical happy ending. So the word eucatastrophe, built on catastrophe, the Greek, for kata, down, and strephein, to turn. In a general sense, catastrophe, as in Spanish, can mean any kind of cataclysmic disaster, oh, as in exams period, no? <laughs> uh, in its narrower definition, it marks the downturn of fortune in Greek tragedy that leads to the protagonist's fall. By adding Greek eu, good, as a prefix, Tolkien has reversed the meaning and the direction so that the turn leads upward to the happy ending. So, eucatastrophe is the defeat of catastrophe. This should be the guideline that allows us to verify if such elements are present and in which way 
in Lewis' work. First, Surprised by Joy, the autobiographical text of his early years, is the only way, in the only place, in which Lewis explicitly used the word He was telling that he was reading the Odyssey, and he says, till the music of the thing and the clear bitter brightness that lives in almost every formula had become part of me. The wanderings mean as much as ever they did. The great moment of eucatastrophe, as Professor Tolkien would call it, when Odysseus strips off his rags and bends the bow means more. So Lewis explains the uh, manifestation of Odysseus when he arrives back home as a moment of eucatastrophe, you know, the turning of the story and the beginning of the happy ending. Then he says, um, he received as a gift the Nibelungen ring uh, and the thought of all that reading before me, mixed with the coldness and lowliness of the hillside, the drops of moisture in every branch, and the distant murmur of the concealed town, has produced a longing, yet it was also fruition, which had flowed over from the mind and seemed to involve the whole body. That walk I now remember. It seemed to me that I have tested heaven then. True, it was desire, desire to read, not possession. But then what I had felt on the walk has also been desire and only possession in so far as that kind of desire is itself desiderable, is the fullest possession we can know on earth. So again, this longing a sort of anticipation of something which enters in this happy turn of things. And he continues, in my scheme of thought, is it not blasphemous to compare what I was, the, the error that I was making, confusing the two things, you know, the, the, the longing to read and the pleasure of reading, with the error that the angel at the sepulchre rebuked when he said to the woman, why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, he is risen. The comparison is of course between something of infinite moment and something very small, like comparison between the sun and the sun's reflection in a dewdrop. Indeed, in my view, very like it, for I do not think the resemblance between the Christian and the merely imaginative experience is accidental. I think that all things in their way reflect heavenly truth. The imagination, not least, reflect is the important word. And again, it's a concept that is present in Tolkien. Every reflection, even in a small dewdrop, is a reflection of true light which Tolkien would say, it gives a sense that there is a light behind things. At the end, in Surprise by Joy, he doesn't speak about a hope after death, but he makes a sort of allusion to the heavenly Jerusalem. And finish his book saying, when we have found the road and are passing signposts every few miles, we shall not stop and stare, not on this road, though the pillars are of silver and the lettering of gold. We would be at Jerusalem. Not, of course, that I don't often catch myself stopping to stare at roadside objects of even less importance. So everything for him is a golden and silver signpost for something further. That is, in Surprise by Joy. Then, in his last novel, which is his best, Till We Have Faces, a myth retold, the old myth of Psyche and Eros. No? 
Psyche, the younger sister, tells her older sister, Orwal, who is the protagonist, I have always had a kind of longing for death. It was when I was happiest that I longed most. Do you remember the color and the smell and looking across at the gray mountain in the distance? And because it was so beautiful, it set me longing, always longing. Somewhere else, there must be more of it. Everything seemed to be saying, Psyche, come. But I couldn't, not yet come. I felt like a bird in a cage when the other birds of its kind are flying home. So all the novel is the wrath of her older sister, Orwell, who was ugly, after Psyche died in a sacrifice, or so she thought, in the mountain, to the god of the mountain. And it's a quest to revenge for her grief of losing her sister. And at the end of the novel, Orwell himself met Psyche and are brought with her to a very strange place in which, in which she, she feels that someone is approaching. Suddenly, from a strange look in Psyche's face, or from a glorious and awful deepening of the blue sky above us, or from a deep breath like a sigh uttered all around us by invisible lips, or from a deep, doubtful quaking and sermons in my own heart, I knew that all this had been only a preparation. Some far greater matter was upon us. He is coming, they said. The God is coming into his house. If Psyche had not held me by hand, I should have sunk down. She had brought me now to the very edge of the pool. The air was growing brighter and brighter about us, as if something had set it on fire. Each breath I drew let into me new terror, joy, overpowering sweetness. I was pierced through and through with the arrows of it. I was being unmade. I was no one. And at the end, the most dreadful, the most beautiful, the only dread and beauty there is was coming. The pillars of the far side of the pool flushed with his approach. I cast down my eyes. I ended my book with the words, no answer. I know now, Lord, why you utter no answer. You are yourself the answer. Before your face, questions die away. What other answer would suffice? In this way, finish the novel with this joyous, unexpected turn at the end. True eucatastrophe. Which is the defeat of the universal defeat. And the last book, published posthumous after Lewis' death, A Grief of Served, was his private diary, wrote after the death of his wife, after three years of, of marriage, um, was made the movie with uh, Anthony Hopkins, no? It's very crude, the diary, beautiful when someone is in grief. It is hard to have patience with people who say there is no death, or death doesn't matter. There is death, and whatever it is, matters. And whatever happens has consequences, and they are irrevocable and irreversible. You might as well say that birth doesn't matter. Birth and death clear facts. And not in the sense that Tolkien would say the birth of Christ is the eucatastrophe of man history and the resurrection is the eucatastrophe of the story of the incarnation. This story begins and ends in joy. 
but rather that in mortal time the trajectory of life is marked as well by pain, suffering, loss. Clear. So Lewis continues saying, I need Christ, not something that resembles him. I want my wife, not something that is like her. My idea of God is not a divine idea. It has to be shattered time after time. Could we not almost say that this shattering is one of the marks of his presence? The incarnation is the supreme example. It leaves all the previous ideas of the Messiah in ruins. And most are offended by the iconoclasm. So he closely, step by step, goes near to Tolkien's perception. Can a mortal ask questions which God finds unanswerable? Quite easily, I should think. All nonsense questions are unanswerable. How many hours are there in a mile? Is yellow square or round? Probably half the questions we ask, half our great theological and metaphysical problems are like that. The fruition of God, reunion with the dead, the mystical union of the one hand, the resurrection of the body on the other. I can't reach the ghost of an image, a formula or even a feeling that combines them. Reality, the iconoclast, once more. Heaven will solve our problems, but not, I think, by showing us subtle reconciliations between all our apparently contradictory notions. The notions will all be knocked from under our feet. We shall see that there were never, that, that never was any problem. And more than once, that impression, which I can't describe except by saying, that is, the like, that is like the sound of a chuckle in the darkness. The sense that some shattering and disarming simplicity is the real answer. And he told the last moments of, of her wife. Once very near the end, I said, if you can, if it is allowed, come to me when I too am on my deathbed. Allowed, she said. Heaven would have a job to hold me. And as for hell, I'll break it into bits. She knew she was speaking a kind of mythological language, with even an element of comedy in it. There was a twinkle as well as a tear in her eye. But there was not myth and no joke about the will, deeper than any feeling that flashed through her. She smiled, but not at me. Poi si tornò all'eterna fontana. Lewis, as Tolkien, used mythical in its perfect significance. Poi si tornò all'eterna fontana ends the book. It's a quote from Dante, where Beatrice turns away from him toward the eternal fountain. So we have these turning elements in Lewis as well. The a sort of, in, in, in the middle of sorrow, in the middle of grief, there is a turning which changes the atmosphere. So you have, most of you have this uh, uh, sheet with the, is letter 81 by Tolkien to his son Christopher. The, I will use freely from the last paragraph of the first page, and then uh, in the back, uh, some part of this, but you don't need to, to read it now. It's a long quote, but it's very, very interesting uh, because it's um, together with unfairy stories is the only other place in which Tolkien explains what is your catastrophe. And somehow he explains it better. He says that he was uh, with, with his daughter at, at Mass and the priest during the homily uh, told about the uh, moving story of a little kid with tubercular peritonitis uh, who was not healed at the grotto in Lourdes and was taken sadly away in the train by his parents, practically dying. As the train moved away, it passed within sight of the grotto 
the little boy sat up and said, I'm hungry. And he was totally healed. So uh, Tolkien was very moved because of this turning uh, of, of a total despair and hopelessness to the joyful plenitude of complete healing. And, and he says also that the, the preacher could not resist adding that there was also a Capuchin friar who was mortally ill, had eaten nothing for years, and he was cured, and he was so delighted about it that he rushed off and had two dinners, and that night he had not his old pains, but an attack of plain ordinary indigestion. No? All of a sudden, I realize what it was. I have a sensation unlike any other sensation. And I realize what it was. The very thing that I, I have been trying to write about and explain in that fairy story essay. For I coined the word eucatastrophe, the sudden happy turn in a story which pierces you with a joy that brings tears which I argue it is the highest function of fairy stories to produce. And I concluded by saying that the resurrection was the greatest eucatastrophe possible in the greatest fairy story and produced that essential emotion, joy which produced tears because it is qualitatively so like sorrow, because it comes from those places where joy and sorrow are at one, reconciled, a selfishness and altruism are lost in love. So he said, in the primary world, that was the rescue of all nonsense of suffering. That's the resurrection. No? And that is a glimpse of the truth behind the apparent ananke, doom, no? of the world. But a glimpse that is actually a ray of light through the very chinks of the universe about us. So for Tolkien, it's fundamental to say there is so much darkness, but there is a kind of heart of light under the cover of darkness. Within darkness, within the opacity of reality, there is a hidden brightness. So when he was riding uh, in his bicycle, in a certain moment, I said, but of course, of course, that's how things really do work. No, he was rethinking on that. Uh, and, and he adds, it's more or less as when Bilbo says, eagles are coming, eagles are coming, no? in, in the mo in, at the end of the Battle of the Five Armies in The Hobbit. That is eucatastrophe, to be in rescue from suffering, rescue from hopelessness. So the, the complete uh, letter is, is worth reading. I'm awfully afraid that we should do a little theology here to try to grasp the meaning of the resurrection as eucatastrophe. We need it as an hermeneutical tool to understand the depth of the Tolkienian neologism. It is a serious and dangerous matter, and it is presumptuous to touch upon such a theme, although I may have a little excuse because unlike Tolkien and Lewis, I dare say I'm a professional theologian, but the, the risky thing is that here we are not speaking only about fairy stories or fantasy, as we said at the beginning. Because in, both in Lewis' experience and in Tolkien's experience, there is a certain moment that their capacity of perceiving how reality works, even in the subcreation word, is a reflection of how things really function. No? So this kind of source of joy and light, which is deeper and stronger than the opacity of a very difficult world. That is how things really do work, says Tolkien. So, um, 
That does not deny the existence of this catastrophe, of sorrow and failure, but affirms the possibility of the joy of deliverance, and it denies, in the face of much evidence, universal final defeat, giving a fleeting glimpse of joy, joy beyond the walls of the world, of the world poignant as grief. In this world, world, suffering and disease are indeed normal, but their very normalcy is abnormal. They reveal the ultimate and permanent defeat of man and of life, a defeat with no partial victories of medicine, however wonderful, can ultimately overcome. So when Tolkien and Lewis says that in the resurrection, suffering is not removed is transformed into victory, the defeat itself becomes victory, which is a permanent healing. Life who overcome death. That is, that is already happened with the resurrection of one person and is still to happen in the rest of us. So something that is already and is not yet. A sort of paradox because we live in two worlds simultaneously. It's a sort of dual condition. More or less as Glorfindel, the elfin lord from uh, Elrond's house, when in, in the Ford of Brunnen, the Nazgul are uh, drawn by the, by the river, Frodo remembers seeing some light in the midst of the, of the darkness that fall upon him. And Gandalf explained to him, you saw Glorfindel, those who have dwelt in the blessed realm live at once in both worlds, and against both the seen and the unseen, they have great power. Yes, I thought that I saw a white figure that shone and did not grow dim. Was that Lord Findel? Yes, you saw him for a moment as he is upon the other side, one of the mighty of the firstborn. So finally, the two things are together. There is a reality of defeat and death, but within this death, resurrection breaks through as a true eucatastrophic event. For Tolkien and Lewis, resurrection is the greatest eucatastrophe because it redeems everything that is human, everything that belongs to human life and to human love, and even the power of death is undone. Everything is recovered restored, free from the emptiness of death, made new. It's the great joy that these disciples felt when they saw the risen Lord, that burning of hearts that they experienced on the way to Emmaus, Gospel of Luke in chapter 24. And it's curious enough, they recognize the risen Lord because he has the wounds. The same one who suffered is the risen one, not a different one. He remained wounded. He remained wounded as at the end because it's, it's a mark of having suffered out of love. We know nothing about whens and hows, but for Tolkien and, and, and Lewis, the fact that once that happen, it means that can happen. So that there is light, true light, at the end of the tunnel. Um, there is a synthesis of all this for both of them. By the risen Christ, we are no longer living promise to death, but mortal promise to life. We are still mortal, 
but our destiny is life. It's not only that we are more or less alive and our destiny is only to die. Man's doomed to die. That is, is written within the ring of power. So seeing things in that way is seeing things on Sauron uh, vision. We are not only doomed to die. We are mortal with a fate to be alive forever. So, yes, we can say that eucatastrophe is present in Lewis's work. We saw it something in Surprised by Joy, Till We Have Faces and A Grief of Surf. But it seems to me that in Tolkien, that eucatastrophe is more fleshy, more carnal, more sacramental, more real. And in Lewis, it's a bit less of that. Lewis is a bit more mental, more theoretical. Tolkien was much more concrete. Everything becomes true in Tolkien. No? You know that his, uh, in his tomb he wrote Beren and Luthien. No? Of course, it's sub-creation, but it's true. It's, it's reality who comes no? uh, together with sub-creation. And for that is that sense of joy because what Aragon dying says to Arwen, beyond the circles of the word, there is more than memory. And the last word that Arwen cries is the elfish name of Aragon, Estel, which is hope. A fleeting glimpse of joy, joy beyond the walls of the world, poignant as grief. The great moment of the catastrophe, as Professor Tolkien would call it. The air was growing brighter and brighter about us, as if something had set it on fire. Each breath I drew let into me new terror, joy, overpowering sweetness. I was pierced through and through with the arrows of it. I was being unmade. Or as in the fields of Cormalen, is said about the hobbits and all the warriors, their hearts wounded with sweet words overflowed, and their joy was like swords, and they pass in thought out the regions where pain and delight flow together, and tears are the very wine of blessedness. Is the description that on fairy stories Tolkien make on eucatastrophe. Tears and joy blended together. We shall see that there never was any problem, said Lewis the sense that some shattering and disarming simplicity is the real answer. Or as Orwell says, you are yourself the answer. Before your face, questions die away. What are the answer with Sufis? So the freshness, deep down things, as Hopkins would say, this light which is hidden, gives the sense and the perspective to everything. For that both Lewis and Tolkien, though they suffer so much in life, they were full of hope and full of humor. And that would be an extremely precious gift from them to us, especially in this Holy Week. In a few days we will be celebrating the same thing that gave sense and perspective to all the writing in the Easter night. The true light and the true life who overcome darkness and death. That is freely offered, freely given, and it's on us if we want to become disciples of Tolkien and Lewis to grasp at this gift. Thank you. Okay, then thank you very much, Guillermo, for this, uh, for this perspective on Lewis and Tolkien. This is a theological perspective, of course, very appropriate, given uh, that both writers were Christian writers. Uh, what is really interesting about uh, Lewis and Tolkien is mm, their relation to myth. 
and how they deal with the issues of uh, death and immortality through the lens mm -hmm. of myth and how it reflects Christian myth, of course, um, but it's also set in a world which is pre-Christian in Tolkien's case. Um, that is, there is no direct one-to-one -one relationship between what is going on in Tolkien's story and what is going on formally in, in the Gospels, for instance. No, no, absolutely not. And uh, Lewis was always fascinated by uh, the old heathen stories of Adonis, Bacchus, and Balder as well, no? The, the, this dying and, and coming back to life. Uh, um, and that was the, the long conversation that he has, C.S. Lewis, with Tolkien and Hugo Dyson, no? Because Lewis was always in love with these old myths and stories and the nostalgia that was within them. And what Tolkien and Dyson said to him, yes, but all these myths are true, are not only myths. And that was the, the moment for Lewis of changing perspective, no? saying, so all my longings and my nostalgies and my fancies are a glimpse of real, as something that really happened in history. Uh, so th that is the wonderful experience both of Lewis and Tolkien, that they, they never threw away anything. They just put together things and kept anyth everything. They never need to choose all this or that. Was and this and that. Of course, so, so they don't say that the po old pagan myths, for example, are false. I mean, C.S. Lewis, he used to believe that. He used to say that they were lies breathed through silver. Through silver. And Tolkien corrects him is it, is in Mythopoeia, in his poem, yes. right? And he, he says not lies. they are not lies. And he talks about refracted light yeah, yes. yeah, as a reflection of some true light, which even in the, in the pagan stories would, would be present. And that is the things as, as they work, not as Tolkien said, with every real desire that we have, every real deep dream is the same thing. It's a reflection of something true. Uh, for that, it's so magnificent. No? And for that, we can keep um, a sense of uh, hobbit joyfulness. Though there is a very weak point in this, in this conference. They have no beer. Uh, that will be amended in, in, I hope in so. just an hour. For all, that for will all of be us. a catastrophe, yes. yes. <laughs> I'm sure that there are many questions. Uh, we have a microphone over there, Kites. Okay, Guillermo, thank you very much for the conference. Uh, I have really enjoyed it. And uh, I would like to ask you one thing. Uh, you have said before that resurrection is uh, the truth of catastrophe, right? And I was thinking about uh, the last battle, then the last book of the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, with the end of that kind of secondary war. And then there is a kind of resurrection. There is another Narnia inside Narnia, and, and so on and on. A kind of true of the uh, second chance, second life, whatever. But in a sense, Susan is defeated. She gets outside. So for me, I, I, I mean, when I read it, it was not a happy ending at all, because she was not included. So my question is, she has no faith, no faith in Aslan, no faith in a sense in God. So was she penalized and taken apart from that kind of catastrophe because of that, because of faith? Only C.S. Lewis himself would be able to answer. Um, no, yeah. um, uh, I, uh, I, I believe that the way in which, in which Lewis is telling the thing is, if you don't ha if you don't keep a child's heart, reality becomes opaque. No? Instead, if you keep a child's vision, you see also the unseen world. So uh, it's, it's a defense not to remain Peter Pan's and to refuse to grow up, but to keep this kind of um, simplicity, the, the, the capacity of 
enjoying tales. No? Uh, otherwise, you will become as Theoden uh, warriors who will laughing about old wives' tales as if they were only old wife tales. And they are unable to recognize the wonders that are seeing with their own eyes. I think so that the punishment is only that. If you become to behave as a grown up, you lose the deepest things of life. So to become really grown up is to remain childlike, not childish. Uh, um, it's the, um, Chesterton would say, if you don't believe in dragons, no, uh, you can have no idea what reality is. Uh, because dragons, of course, exist. And dragons has a mother and has grandmother. So you don't have a grandmother if you don't believe in dragons. No? Because in, in every nightmare, you will have something terrifying. No? Uh, so that, that way of, in which a child will be capable of answering with better philosophy than a grown-up. I believe that it's only that, you know, to keep the sense of, of, of the um, brightness of sight that a child has and that a grown-up can lose. Yeah. Uh, f first time that, that I, I mean, in the premiere of uh, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, uh, I was in Dublin and I was just surrounded by, uh, by kids. So uh, at the very end of the film, uh, one of them uh, says to, to his mother, uh, Mom, Mom, I want to be good. I want to be like Aslan. And that was, you know, for me, the, the beginning of, of everything, you know? And it was like 10 years ago. So, I mean, there is something still there. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for some other question before ending the session over here. Uh, after answer, I'm aware to question, but uh, it's in the ending of the Lord of the Rings. You you call all the uh, catastrophe is, is happy and all the things, but when I read it, I think, mm, why, Frodo? Why do you uh, you you are the the hero of the story, but you have to go? I I don't read in English, so I don't know who is in English. The English uh, the gr the Great Herbert. Mm -hmm. the the Grey Havens. The Grey Havens, uh, yes. Uh, and it's like uh, all is finished, the, the, for some it's alive, but it's like, it's not, uh, for me it's not like an, a catastrophe, but uh, now that you are explaining that, I see like the, how do you say, it's Grey Harbor or? Grey Havens. Grey Havens, it's like uh, the, the other life for Frodo, it's like uh, something like that is now come in my mind. Uh, Tolkien answers something that uh, the, the taking the ship is not Frodo's death. Mm. It's, it's not that. But the, so, it's a kind of eucatastrophe. It's a dynamic. No? There are moments of eucatastrophe. And in a, in, in a story, there are turning points. But somehow, as we are still within the circles of the world, things are unfinished no so the the there is this already but not yet so for that the 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 true ending is sam coming back home no? and saying i am back uh, because still within the experience of time we keep having the longing for the total eucatastrophe of everything, but it's not fulfilled yet, because we are in the not yet. No? So it's, uh, we have a tendency, I, I believe, of using things as substantives. No? Give me a kilo of eucatastrophe. No? Uh, and it's more like an adverb. Um, will be eu that is, will be an adjective, no? Eucatastrophizar, uh, no? Something like com the, the movement of perceiving this passing of light through darkness. No? It's not only a substantive, 
not only an adjective, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a movement, no? It would be a, um, an adverb, it would be the, a, with its, that would be a Paul Francis creation, no? Que, al Papa Francisco que le encanta inventar palabras, no? Misericordiando, no? Eh, eh, que, que no existe. Um, eucatrastrofizando, sí. The, the, the perception of reality as this movement of, of going to eucatastrophe. So don't, without accepting the, how to say, the evidence of defeat, no? and uh, still seeing these uh, glimpses of light who pass through the um, en, en las fortalezas medievales, ¿cómo es que se llaman esas? Eh, no, en las, la, las ventanas troneras, troneras ¿no? Eh, es como si a través de las troneras entra una luz y el resto del, del, de la muralla es, es, es piedra, o, piedra opaca, ¿no? Pero solamente donde la fortaleza tiene troneras es por donde puede entrar luz, lluvia, pólenes, eh, todo lo que sea fecundidad. Lo que es una herida en la muralla. ¿no? Eh, en ese sentido es muy eucatastrófico. ¿no? Las heridas de la vida suelen ser el pasaje por, el, por donde pasa verdaderamente una luz que uno no elegiría, porque uno preferiría que todo estuviera perfecto y no funciona. ¿no? Eh, el, la dinámica de la, de la eucatástrofe es descubrir que en lo que parece que todo está andando realmente mal, hay algo escondido y luminoso que hace girar la cosa. ¿no? Eh, eso en cualquier buena historia, aunque quede suspendida, porque ninguna historia termina completamente. En, en las escaleras de Kiritungol, eh, Sam y Frodo están hablando de esto, que no termina nunca una historia. No, no, no termina nunca. Van pasando los actores, pero la historia continúa. Eh, la... La, la, la diferencia para la cual ellos la aplican, es decir, está bien, todo esto estaría muy lindo, pero con la muerte se termina y no hay nada que hacerle. Por eso es que dicen que la resurrección es la verdadera eucatástrofe final de la historia, porque nos rescata de la única derrota que, sobre la cual no tenemos ninguna posibilidad. Perdón por haber cambiado, arruinado la lengua. Creo que es ok, ¿no? Creo que es ok aquí. Um, uh, uh, finally, uh, uh, thank you very much for the uh, explanation of the catastrophe. Now I see the, the ending of, of the Lord of the Rings in another kind of type. Because I, now I remember that after that is the genealogies of the son of the son of the son and the son of the son of the son of the son of the son. I, I think it's the best part of the Lord of the Rings. Eh, porque se ve eh, el, la, la, las, las buenas semillas va, siguen produciendo, ¿no? Incluso, que además creo que es lo último, lo último, eh, Gimli y Legolas que se embarcan porque Gimli quiere volver a ver a Galadriel, ¿no? Eh, el, el deseo de algo que, que para él es el sentido de la vida, ¿no? Eh, por eso el, el emprender un viaje siguiendo los deseos profundos es el cumplimiento de la eucatástrofe. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, he leaves us speechless here, I think, all of us for a moment. Yeah. I think we will have uh, time to reflect on this and to get back to Guillermo afterwards with uh, you catastrophic moments of beer uh, over at the bookshop uh, at uh, half past seven later on tonight. So he will be more than delighted to continue explaining this with a beer in the hand, of course. Uh, during Lent, no? In Use English Lent. or I use English uh, or Spanish. Whatever. Or, well, uh, um, during Lent, one day Tolkien met Lewis in the pub Bird and Baby, where the English used to meet, and uh, Lewis was drinking a pint, and Tolkien said to him, "But it is Lent," and Lewis answered, "Yes, for that I'm stopping after the second pint." Well, uh, Solamente dos pintas de cerveza, porque es cuaresma, ¿no? Eh, menos de dos pintas es inmoral. ¿no? Eh. Muy bien. Uh, ok, fantástico. So, I think we'll have to leave it here. Um, in, in, at 
quarter past six, uh, Paolo Urquijo will be here to explain his short film and we will have a screening of that film. Uh, thank you very much, Guillermo, for, for the wonderful speech. <laughs>